I'm Edmund Leon Real, uh, born January 31st, 1929. January 31st? Wow. Last day of January. And where are you born? Moorefield, West Virginia. West Virginia. M O R E F I L D, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And what about your family? My family? Yeah, at the time. At the time? At that time. My father and my mother, yes. I'm the oldest son of three. And my mother had, uh, which is an half-brother. Okay. So what school did you go to? You uh, I mean, to start out with, I went out to the first school I went to was Buckley School, B-U-C-K-L-E-Y mm -hmm. School, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. Then from there was transferred to Luxembourg. Uh -huh. uh, and then from Luxembourg then, I went to Moorefield High School. And I left the Moorefield High School and joined the Army. When did you join the Army? I joined the Army on the 25th day of September 1947. So how old were you at the time uh, when you joined the Army? It was even... I was 18. 18. So you didn't need permission from your parents, right? No. No. At 17, you did. And I wanted my father to sign for me so I could go in then, which I'd been on the tail end of World War II. So did you enlisted, right? Yes. Why did you enlist? Why did I enlist? Yeah, yeah why? Well, because at that time, there wasn't drafting. Uh-huh. So uh, Draft I... Draft for what? I mean, there drafting... There was no war there. At the no, time. they were drafting, calling people into the war. Right? Yes. So before you were being drafted, you wanted to volunteer? To oh, yes. Drafted. Okay. Okay. Yes. So you joined the Army. Where did you get the basic military training? Fort Dix, New Jersey. For how long? Tell me about that. Well, I was in one of the last cycles of World War II basic training, mm -hmm. and there you learn everything about uh, field exercises, uh, combat training, and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and what was your specialty? At that time, yeah. I was an infantryman. Rifleman? Yes. So you knew how to shoot? Yes, sir. Good. <laughs> Did and, you catch any? Uh, not at that time. <laughs> and then after, after uh, a basic training, Guess where I wound up at? Where? Korea. I know, but before we're talking about Korea, where did you go? Did and you go to Washington, Seattle, or Seattle, Washington, to, to leave for Korea? Where did you go? No, this was some. We got on a ship to go to Europe, and they converted the ship and sent us then to... Oh, you were on the way to Europe, but they changed that plan and you were sent back to Korea. Correct. No, not sent back to Korea. That was my first tour. Now, this was before the war. When 1948, mm -hmm. uh, if, if then uh, I was there in the Korea, uh -huh. uh, in 1948. You stationed in Korea? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. And our troops, uh, when they up and shipped all the troops out of Korea, uh -huh. which was in December of 1948. Uh, and then I went to Japan. And I was in Japan then until March of 1950. And then I was shipped back to the States here waiting for discharge. You were discharged? Okay? No, no. I was waiting for to be discharged when my, uh -huh. when my enlistment was up. And uh, uh, then the war broke out before I got discharged. And then I went back to Korea. So tell me about this. Did you know anything about Korea before you went to Korea in oh, 1948? Yes. Oh, did I know anything about Korea? Yeah. No. No. And never heard of it. You never heard about Korea? No. Not till they said we was going to Korea mm -hmm. first time. So when you arrived, in Korea, where did you go? Was it Busan or Incheon? Uh, Incheon. Incheon. Best damn port in the area. Big 
big sign. <laughs> what was your first impression about Korea? Well, uh, not expecting it, you know. I, I, I come to my mind and say, what hell have I got into now? <laughs> but once we got once we got in and and uh, got arranged and what have you and all, yeah. Where did you station in Korea? I was stationed uh, right out of Seoul. Uh, Seoul? Yeah, close to 38th parallel. Close to 38th parallel. Yeah, I, I, I guarded the 38th parallel for about six weeks. Oh, you guarded? Uh, oh, yeah. I oh. walk them down the mountains, look across over into North Korea and see the Russians over there, yeah. Oh, you were able to see North Koreans? Oh, yeah. That close. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we was up on the 38th there, up on the mountain there, and you, with our monoculars and what have you. And uh, we could look across over there and see the Russians over there. Russians, too? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Pretty girls. So, uh, what do you mean pretty girls? Right, pretty girls. The, girl, the women? The women was there? pretty, yeah. Okay. I guess they had their wives over there, or girlfriends, but they were pretty. Because it was during, it wasn't during the war, right? No, no, this before the war. Were you able to uh, tell that it's going to be completely changing from that peace period to the war? Do you, do well, you even sense anything that is coming? What uh, the war? Yeah. At that time? At the time. Not really, no. But I told the men, dig them foxholes when we was out training. We'll be back here using them. <laughs> How was the situation at the 38 parallels at the time? Well, we was just out living in the huts. And I got a little, a little remembrance right there. What is that? That's where my lip was cut and split open there. Why? Well, when I told one of my men to get up to go guard the parallel, his door, and uh, the second time when I told him to get up, he jumped up and hauled off his fist and busted to there. I could stick my tongue out. Yeah. Were there any skirmish between um, U.S. soldiers and North Koreans or the Russians? No skirmish? No, no, not at that time, though. So it was very peaceful. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Before we left there, things started getting a little hot. What did you tell yourself about the breakout of the Korean War? Prior to that, I was up in Camp Drum, New York, which is known now. And uh, uh, then when the, this all broke out in July, uh -huh. so they took us back to Fort Devens, Massachusetts, uh -huh. where I was wait to finish my other three months. So there we did a little extra, what we call refresher training. And of course, I guess I might as well tell the truth. We stayed mostly drunk <laughs> because I think probably most of the boys, same thing I did, well, they told us where we was going then. So you were in fear, actually. Oh, yeah. And so uh, uh, we stayed practically drunk. And so, uh, of course, we, I did. I thought, well, uh, I won't if I go. My won't be coming back alive anyway if they come back. So finally they throwed us all on a troop, tr you know, cattle cars. Clear across the whole United States to Camp Stoneman, California. Mm -hmm. And there we was there for a day or two and still drunk. <laughs> and got on the ship. When? Do you remember when? Oh, yes, can't remember that. I don't remember getting on the <laughs> ship, but... Uh, what month? It was August the 25th, 1950. 50. Yeah, that's a ship went over and then it went into Busan. How long did it take to get to Busan? I think about 14 days, I bet. 14 days? Yeah, uh -huh. I think. Did you have a seasick? <laughs> yes. Terrible seasick. Uh -huh. But that wasn't the first time I was seasick. <laughs> so you arrived in Busan. What was the situation there when you arrived there? Well, it was in the apple orchard. 
there. North Koreans had pushed them all the way back to Pusan there. And uh, we got there uh, uh, then uh, there for there too. Then we went into battle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tell me about your second arrival in Korea in, in almost like a, one year or two years, right? Two, two years. Two. How like, did you feel that you were in the battlefield and you may lose your life? Okay. Yes. Tell me about it. Well, the first battle then was the Battle of the Bone Alley, mm-hmm. just short ways from Busan. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, we lost everything that we had, and we fought our way out of there. It was known as the Bone Alley was the battle. And we fought our way out of there, and we lost everything we had. And then we came back to Busan to the Apple Orchard, and was there for a couple of days and reformed uh, up again. And then we proceeded north, and all the way up through Seoul and all, was nothing there, nothing but rubble, all the way. We fought all the way, certain battles, well, and uh, till we got to uh, Pyongyang. And there, uh, they thought the war was over. As a matter of fact, they told us it was. Mm-hmm. Well, we got to clean our equipment up. Going for the Christmas fall, right? Yeah, how'd you know? <laughs> Somebody else must have told you that. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, then, uh, I think probably, I think it was probably the 29th of, of uh, no, 29th of October, October yeah. yeah. And they called us in and told us we was going to move on up and set up a line that wait for new troops to come, we'd relieve us and go home. Well, <laughs> this didn't happen. We was there for a day or two. Mm-hmm. Did, what? You, did you see Chinese soldier at the time around Pyongyang or vicinity of that area? No. You never? No. But did you hear that Chinese soldier were there already? No. You never? No. But you know what? October 4th, Chinese, across, they crossed the Yalu River, early October. And U.S. intelligence actually missed it. Did you know? No. Uh, but anyway. You wish you knew, right? <laughs> uh, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, but I knew when the sound of the guns hit us that morning about 2 o'clock in the morning. I didn't know what the hell really it was with all the bugles and what have you. Right. They just blowed us to kingdom come. Yes. Yes. How many? Can you describe it? Yeah, there must have been five or 600,000. Wow. So what they say about what quite that many, but they was, they were like flies. What did you say to yourself? I think, well, I have done had it. Huh? I thought I'd done had it. My life was gone. Gone. I figured they were, they, uh, were just up and shoot us, kill us. But they didn't. Thank God. Uh, we were some of the first ones to be captured. And they were coming with their rifles up in the air, firing. Uh-huh. And, uh, uh, of course, to me, what went through my mind, which I use and tell my story in the school, uh, it was just like seeing old glory coming to and down. And I got it immediately in my head. I'm not going home, uh, ever go home again. And I just forgot about my loved ones and what have you. And today, I think uh, that is one thing that uh, I've able to survive all the ordeals that I was put through because of that. And when, and with God, with my testament right here, because it's one of the thoughts that was going to happen to me. 
Tell me about the day that you were captured. Tell me about the details. We was at, we was in uh, Anson County. That's where we were at. And of course, I was captured there. And then... You said Anson? Anson. 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 Okay. That's where we were set up at. Mm -hmm. And that's where I was captured at. Where a lot of us was captured, what wasn't dead. And uh, then uh, that evening, what it was, that was that morning. That evening is uh, rather that afternoon late. They did you surrender or how did you? Oh, yeah. You surrender? Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It was terrible to have to do that. But when you got about 5,000 that come right at you, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. I don't know where the other two soldiers went. Here I am, just a soldier here, with 5,000 enemy in front of me. Right. What are you going to do? Right. And uh, uh, then after I was captured, they uh, marched us uh, to a building. Uh, and, uh, of course, they didn't allow us in the building. We sat outside beside this building in the cold. And... Uh, and uh, there, then until later in the evening, then they marched uh, uh, myself and uh, the other two GIs uh, away. But there was two South Korean soldiers mm -hmm. that was captured with me, but they took them away from me immediately. So this, as I said, it started getting uh, dark or dusk, as we say. They marched us down the road a little piece up into a pine thicket. And there, there was some more of the individuals. And, uh, what do you mean by individual Americans? Yeah, Americans, yeah, soldiers. And uh, then uh, uh, they had a great big tub of sweet potatoes. And uh, then uh, they told us, now, we're going to feed you, and then we're going to march you to the rear. One of my buddies who was with me, he was wounded, so we got rice bags. It was big rice bags, mm -hmm. and we made a stretcher. Mm -hmm. And I carried one of the stretcher every night because we marched at night and slept in the daytime. Right. And uh, uh, then uh, as we, uh, uh, like I said, and the second night out or the third night, uh, this leg here started swelling on me. And I didn't know why. So I pulled up my pants and all, and I seen here that I'd been wounded with shrapnel in this knee. You didn't know? No. I'd been scared so bad, didn't know. It wasn't really that bad, you know. But uh, I would, in the mud shacks where they kept us at during the day, I kept a steel helmet, and I would heat water in it and bathe my knee. And uh, like I say, each night we marched for about 30 nights until they got us back to the rear uh, to uh, Ponyang. Belkton, excuse, Belkton. Belkton, excuse me. Yes. Once we got there, we were turned over to the, to the Chinese, I mean the Koreans, North Koreans. Mm. There we were, there, put over to them. They kept us there then as a, for eight months. And, of course, well, uh, d right after we was captured there, and some of the other interview people probably that you've interviewed will tell you the same thing yeah. that I'm telling you. We was there for, I don't know how many, it wasn't too long, that they moved us back down the road that we came up mm -hmm. because they were bombing and strafing across over the mountain or the hills there to the electric company, factory. And uh, so they moved us out of there and moved us back down the road and marched us up into a big ravine. That ravine then became as known as Death Valley. Oh. There's where we lost our first person to die. Now, you've probably heard the word uh, to some of the soldiers, maybe who was in Death Valley, if you've interviewed anybody from hard labor camp. Uh, no, it wouldn't be hard labor camp then. From the when he was there, mm -hmm. Father Capone. Did you ever hear his name? Yeah, yeah. He was awarded with the uh, Medal of Honor recently. He was with me, or I was with him. Oh, really? 
I wrote nice letters uh, telling about him and I helped him to get to Medal of Honor here a few weeks ago. And I was hoping I'd get to, when I found out that I'd get to a letter to go to it, but I didn't. But anyway, he got it. it was a, this, if. Excuse me. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Dad. I do this when I'm telling the story in school. Excuse me. If <laughs> if there's ever a man that's in heaven, he's up there. He was one of them. He would sneak out at night at nights uh, through the compounds and what have you. Father Capone, as I said, he'd sneak out at night with him. And Father Capone, he smoked uh, tobacco. It was, I can't remember it. He liked Prince Albert. But he may not have Prince Albert at the time. However, he smoked a pipe. And when he'd get into our little compound or mud shack, our, he would get out his uh, his pipe. Mm -hmm. And he would light us. He says, now, you people who smoke, take a drag off of it. Just a drag, because we wanted this to go around. And then he would have a, a, a prayer with us. Is that the one that actually... No. no. I got this to show when I go to the kids. Got it. I use that to that. Yeah. But he, I don't think it was a Prince Albert can. Mm -hmm. But he smoked Prince Albert when he could get it. Mm -hmm. These are soybeans. Uh -huh. This is... While I was there in Death Valley, uh, they fed us uh, some soybeans. And you cook them things all day long. They're still... They're not done. And as I used the word hunger, which I very seldom ever do, mm -hmm. it's just like using God in vain to, to me, that word is. I always like to use the word empty. And when they pass through your body and on out and all, and you go out and you pick them up and eat them again, that's when you are hungry. This is cracked corn. Mm -hmm. They had cracked corn. And we try to eat that, that little bit of cracked corn that they give us. Okay. So you collect this, not from them. No, I'm you're here. Just showing it to yeah, the, the kids. reality yeah. of your hunger. Yes. This is the food that we fed. The, this is sorghum mm -hmm. that they have over there. Sorghum. Sorghum, right. Mm -hmm. Fed some of that. And I know what you this is. What do you call it? Mille. Yes. Yeah. You're sure. That they fed us a lot of that. That was that was our breakfast. How many meals did you have in the camp? They five? camp five. We had two a day. Two a day. Yes, my whole my whole thirty four months was two a day. Our rations was a canteen cup full. Reason no, I know. Reason why I know is because I did a lot of the cooking, mm -hmm. and we measured this out: half of it for morning, the other half at night. Mm -hmm. This is not actually the cup that I brought back, uh, but the, um, the original cup I did bring home with me is down in the museum. Why there is a difference between Camp Five and Camp Three? The reason why you call Camp Five. After the Chinese taking us over, uh -huh. they numbered the camps, one, two, and three. Uh -huh. So, when you speak, but when you speak of Camp Five, it wasn't numbered when I was there. I see. When the Chinese taking us over, they named it as Camp Five. Y yes, they yes. But it's actually it's a Pyeongtong, right? Yes. Right. And then the Chinese started their damn communist studies. And all that. So 150 of us, no, we're not going to do it. Oh, you refuse? We refuse. They want us to write, we know right. They want us to this, 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 and this. We didn't do it. So they took 150 of us and put us on a barge and all night down the river and put us in what become the hard labor camp of number three. 
as far as I know, we were the first GIs to be in Camp 3. The reason I say that is after they got us there, and, oh, we're going to give you good food and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a little bit of better food, yes. Yeah, better, right? Yes. And so they tried again with their communist studies. Mm -hmm. Well, we refused. Again? Again. What so, was the consequence? Put us, to, put us to work, but not doing what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. We wanted to build roads. No, they, we didn't do that. They made us unload barges, and uh, the uh, uh, cut wood, dig playgrounds, dig bomb shelters, and, th and things of that nature. If a, if a morning then, they would. Uh, uh, after they get us up, send us to the river to wash, come back and take a physical calisthenics, and feed us some of this garbage here, which tastes mighty good when you're hungry. And uh, then they would make us carry rocks way down here and on up around the waters and way over there to the other village over there, we'd lay down the rocks, and then they would march us on up the road, or whatever you want to call it, or I presume we'd probably be back up the road, and march us up into the mountains. And we'd go up there, we'd cut big poles, light poles, telephone poles, big ones. And of course, we all had a, we had old homemade axes. And of course, by being an old farm boy, I uh, carried the axe and I do the chopping. And the rest of the boys, they scoot these big poles off of the mountain. And of course, there'd be guards all the way up this side of the mountain, up this side of the mountain, we'd be working in between. And then when the evening come, they would come back off, then we'd have to carry these big long telephone poles or like poles, whatever they use. But we have found later on, and I'll tell you about them what they really you used them for. And then we carry them all the way back. Now, if we had good guards, they'd let us lay them down and take a break. But if you had a bunch of SOs, they'd make you choke you the damn things all day long, all eating long, back. Then when you get back there, you may have uh, one, of these, one of these delicates, but not this one. Right. That was, didn't get too much about that. But, uh, but uh, uh, and that was, our, that was our, our summer. But after all summer cutting these logs. That's, that's 1951. That's 1951. Mm -hmm. Then uh, then to come along about uh, oh, August, he said, now we're going to take you to the mountains to cut your winter wood. Oh, fine. My gosh, we'll get to stay warm this winter. So you didn't have any heat in the winter of 1950? No. No heat at all? No. It must be damn cold. Colder than hell. Now do you know how cold hell is? They, it's hell's pretty hot. Then how did you sleep without uh, any heat? Well, and, and when we first captured, we just all huddled. And they made us huddle up in the room, lay down. How many were in the room? I think there's 30 some in my little room. In this room here, they would be, uh, uh, they'd be a hundred more in this room here. What? Yeah, we How use. How can hundred men can fill this room? Well, you go outside, uh -huh. and they'd be a row this way yeah. and a row this way. They march you outside, and then they march in there, and you got there. You lay down, and the other one lay down with his body, and you're like this. Yeah, and that's the way it is. And of course, but that's the way that you can warm each other. Stay together, warm. Right? What clothes we had, what clothes we had, had at the time. Yeah. So you were cutting the wood for the heat for the winter of 1951. Yeah, and didn't you get it. Yeah, and didn't get it. 
We didn't get to burn the wood. Why not? Well, it was prisoners. That was, that's the way it was treated. We're bad boys. We was bad boys. So uh, uh, that was it. And so uh, the, then, uh, well, uh, I should I got ahead of my story and all. When the Chinese took us back, uh, took us back over, they brought us uh, uh, some clothes, thin clothes, and a white shirt that I tell you was. That they, they brought us and gave us a white shirt and a blue coat like and blue trousers and of course their summer shoes and, and give us a cake of soap and march us down to the river and uh, we took a bath first bath we had in eight months this Bible which has got my name in gold on it this Bible was given to me in my eighth grade at school I'll read it what I put in this Bible this tempest was given to me a Christmas, at Christmas, 1946. I believe my school teacher, Elva Park. Mm -hmm. I carried it through the Korean War. Also was able to keep it all through 34 months as a POW. It was in the flood of 1985. So... When I was captured, of course, all American, good American soldiers, we carried our testament up here in this pocket. When after I was captured and they marched me and put me in this barn to start to searching me, and these are my dog tags, identification dogs that we wear. Mm. And when he was searching me and he felt my pockets here, and so it was either at that time it was either life or death as far as I'm concerned again there. So I had learned a few words of Korea, a few words of Japanese. I don't know what I, uh, and whether he understood any of it or not. But anyway, I held this up, yeah, I guess. And I did like this. And he, and he looked at, and I, the Chinese here. Yeah. And I thought, well, listen, he probably gonna take it or slap him, at, but he he didn't. I wish I went and put it in my pocket. I put this back in my shirt pocket. When he came to my dog tags, he left mine on my neck. The other two soldiers that was capturing me, they just grabbed his theirs and jerked them off and threw them away. Why wouldn't you? I don't know. Only thing I know, God must have told him not to do it. I I had an interview with other uh, prisoner of war in who were kept in Pyeongchang, and they said that they were not allowed to keep the Bible whatsoever. I, I, that's true. Huh? But why why me? I don't know. I don't know. That's why. Wow. Why did he leave me with anything? You know what? I had an interview with the Bill Baker from Texas, the Arlington chapter. He kept his own Bible too. It's a little bit smaller than that. Yes, he kept, he had the regular military Bible. Yes. You know him, Bill Baker? No, but the, the Testament. Uh -huh, uh -huh. There, That's the regular military one he had. Yeah. And he wrote the names of his colleague in the camp. You know? The clique? Yeah. Well, uh, so, did you read it every day? Read it through twice. You mean twice a day? No, read the th Bible. Read the whole Bible. Twice. I heard that there are many actually attempted suicide to give up their lives in the camp. Have you seen those? No. No? You never no. heard about it? No. What? He used to, to commit suicide. I, <laughs> some may have. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Why do we have them today, people? Look at the military that's committing suicide today. Right, right, right. Well, what made you uh, survive there? So, when did 
did you know that you were going to be released? Uh, I guess it was the day that they, uh, all the camps was brought together at their headquarters, and uh, which we didn't believe them. And then they told us, hey, we, we'd be going home soon. You know, nobody's excited because we didn't believe it. You didn't believe it? Oh, no. Oh. And, of course, then if uh, us guys, there's 149 of us still living yet, out of the 150, uh, uh, well, maybe someday. Well, if we, if we get to go home, we'll be the last ones. But uh, we was... I guess it's probably in the middle of a turn this loose to come home. Please uh, lift up your booties and show that to the camera and tell me about this story. This story? Uh, as a, an old farm boy and what a, uh, I decided one day uh, that I'm going to start making some booties. Are you talking about in the prison? Or oh, yeah, in, yeah, in the prison, yeah. Right. yeah. These are just a replica, replica of the ones that I made for the boys in the state, uh -huh. uh, in the prison camp. Uh -huh. And uh, I made these, and as I said, here was what, the, the, each individual, this is his clothing that I'd taken uh, to make these. And I made 32 of these while in there before I was released. So the reason why I have this pair of booties here today is because one of the soldiers who came to me uh, after uh, we was put in the hard labor camp, he had been shot clear through the stomach and out the back. And I heated water and nursed his wound. So uh, uh, when he came home, he went to... Uh, uh, Mississippi, where he was from, and uh, I had heard that he got killed in a car wreck shortly after he came home. Well, I never he found survived the prison camp, and then he was yeah. The but uh, I found out then, oh, about uh, ten or fifteen years later, when we was going to we, our POW reunion each year, and here he came to the reunion in a wheelchair, oh. and it's a uh, no. And uh, he said to me, well, there's them all real. And uh, I said, yeah. And before we left there, he said, Ma real, would you make me a pair of booties like you made for me while I was in prison camp? I said, what? Yes. I said, okay, Ray, I'll make you a pair of booties. So after I got home, I sat down and uh, made him a pair of booties. And I mailed them to him. I said, well, listen to myself. I'm going to make me a pair of booties to take and show people. So I made this pair of booties here for my seed that you have here today. What kind of material did you make out of it? Out of, out of here? In the camp. In the camp. The, right here. The shirt. The white shirt. Each, each GI had to give me his shirt. Uh-huh. And you made... I took his shirt and I cut the pattern. His... The... The claw, two sides, two soles, and stuffed them with the cotton out of the ends of the of their overcoat. coat. Well, how did you get the needles and thread? Okay, the needle and thread. I there's a piece of a guide wire that you see on poles. Uh -huh. I took two rocks and I pound them together, and I got a piece of wire. And I took this wire and I had some. A sandstone, and I took and you know, I worked this uh -huh. and made a shark on the end. Then I took two other rocks and I pounded them together to make an eye. Then I took the thread. Can I set this down now? Yeah. Then I took uh, the thread of the, the blankets that issued us. We'd pull the string of thread out of that, and I used to do that. Amazing story, huh? 
and then the the cotton here was uh, packed in here. The was the the cotton that is inside here was out of the tail of the overcoat. And then once I got uh, uh, got the in here, then I sewed up sewed the back up, and then after I did that, then I went through and knotted that so the cotton wouldn't all go down to the bottom or in the end. It's like quilting that Mama and Grandma used to quilt. So that's an angel's booty. Saved a lot of people from the coldest winter. Uh, Edmund L. Real, I'm a Korean War survivor. Uh, 34 months, I was captured on November the 1st, 1950, by the Red Chinese and marched for 30 nights and then turned over to the North Koreans. In order to survive during these eight months of captivity, I maintained my faith in God. I had to try to steal food from the Koreans to keep from starving. I survived standing on a hill holding a rock over my head in the dead of the winter with a guard standing by me for the punishment for stealing shingles from the Koreans. I was going to use the shingles to burn to heat a pot for cooking myself and others in the compound. I survived having the black pneumonia even after praying to God to take me because I was in so much pain and out of my head. One of my buddies, Ray Hudson, was shot through the stomach, through his back. In order for him to survive, I heated water daily to try to clean the wound. He survived in return. In remaining 26 months was spent being held captive by the Chinese. Treatment here was no different than before. A small group tried to make a mass escape and was captured and then in entire 150 were punished by putting us in a large open type building with temperatures 50 to below zero with no heat in order to survive to smuggle real close together for some heat body. I held the others to survive the bitter cold by making them booties for their feet. I would take a man's shirt and a coat for the materials for the man's booties. A number of my buddies, fellow buddies, survived from horrible punishments also. An individual or individuals would try to escape and be captured. They sometimes would be court-martialed, and sometimes they would be thrown in a big hole in the ground and be made to stay there for six months. The only time they were allowed to come out was to use the bathroom. These were some very trying and most horrible experience. But through the prayers and faith in God, I survived. Have you been back to Korea? Oh, sir. There is a revisit program provided by I know all about it. Yes. Would you go? At the present time, I have made up my mind to go. Uh, I had a, a colonel sit beside me at the 6th Annie Banquet mm -hmm. last Tuesday night. Yeah. And, oh, I learned so much about Korea again. And uh, he, he told me all about this. And, and he's telling me he'd like for me to uh, come back and revenge the Korea. He says, I'll take care of you. <laughs> he goes back uh, to Korea in three months. Yeah. I, at the time, I, uh, I really haven't got the, really the courage up, I guess I should say, to, to go. I've seen pictures and I've said to other buddies, I got one or two that's in our outfit, the KW here that's been there. Uh, yeah, I can, I, I can imagine it, uh, you know. And uh, like I say, I was there before the war. Then I saw all the way from Pusan, all the way through South Korea, all the way uh, cut up to the Yule River. And 
and then all I saw going up and when it went through Seoul. But another pile of rubble and all in there. And uh, I, uh, I still, still have that, you know, as my mind is to, uh, you know, uh, to really go. You know what I mean? I thought if I ever had the opportunity, uh, I'm, uh, and get the opportunity to go with the teams that are excavating up there, uh, the, and that we could go all the way up mm-hmm. to where I helped bury some of our buddies. Um, I, I would consider really going to see if I could find him. But uh, up at Camp 5, as you speak of, that big backwater there, uh, which that winter there that once it died, we took him out there and buried him on that brow point of the hill and scrape a little dirt, a little snow on them. Then when the spring there came and before I left the camp five to go to Fleury, they just floated out in their bodies there. Well, those bodies now are down in the bottom. That's been drained. And I, I've been told by DOD. Yeah. Ed, if there is a meeting arranged between you and Chinese soldier in that camp, would you be willing to shake hands with him? Yes, I will now. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I would. Why? A Chinese soldier. Yeah. Because let me let me tell you this way. After they, after we was in prison that long, mm-hmm. uh, the uh, the uh, the lady interpreter and uh, the one. Uh, platoon leader who was in, well, there's both officers uh, for each platoon. And uh, the the platoon leader who couldn't speak no English, but when he left there, he could speak pretty good English. Now he, he and of course the interpreter, were very good to us. They, if I could shake his hand, and her hand, I call her her, because we nickname them women. Oh. Yeah. Our interpreter, we nicknamed her Maxine because she was so feminine and all. Mm-hmm. But I would, if I could day, if I could meet, I don't remember his name, if I could meet him and her, mm-hmm. or him and him, <laughs> yes, I would. Yes, I would. Because they, those two individuals, especially him, were real good to us prisoners there. I had to say that that way. What about North Korea? Uh, no, I don't. No. No. no, no, no. So I want to thank you very much for your sacrifice and service, and uh, uh, I want to present this uh, certificate. Uh, it's a certificate of Ambassador for Peace, which was made by the. Korean government's Ministry of Patriots and Veterans Affairs and also Korean Veterans Association. And I wrote your name in Korean as it pronounced, Ed Real. Okay, Ed Real. So please read it and show it to the camera, please. Ed Real. Ed Real. This picture here was taken the day I was released, which was the 24th day of 19, August 1950. I got back on it uh, the 25th, the same ship that I got off of three years to the day. This picture here is the, uh, where the was having a swimming meet. Mm-hmm. And uh, individuals from other prison camp, you know, which they would come and have a swimming meet there, we weren't allowed to go to other camps. So this is have to be the picture of the day. That's the group from the here, uh, because they we didn't have no hats left like that in our camp. So evidently, the uh, it was one of the other camps, which was away from us. Wow, this is an exceptional picture. The prisoners are swimming there. Yes. My goodness. Thank you for sharing this picture with us.